continuing now in our study through the book of Romans. We happen to be at Romans chapter 8, the passage is verses 9 to 13, and we are currently now in the third main section of Paul's body of the letter to the Romans. And really, there is one central thought, there is one central idea on the mind of the Apostle Paul in this third main section, and that main idea, it has to do with the theological truth that we call sanctification. This has been a term or a theological term that we've been using a lot over the last couple of months as we've been studying through Romans chapters 6 to 8. And really, in Romans chapter 6 to 8, this spans this third main section of Paul's letter to the Romans. And really, the the one idea, yes, sanctification, but the one central idea that he wants us to understand is simply this. He wants us to understand that God has not only purposed to save our souls, but he has also purposed to change our lives. While it is true that we are saved or that we are justified by faith alone, Paul wants us to understand that a faith that saves will never be alone. He wants us to understand that a faith that saves will always be accompanied with a changed life. And so how has Paul sought to unravel this truth to us in this third main section of his letter? Well, in chapter 6 of of the book of Romans here, after laying out the reality of our new life in Christ, then in chapter 7, after pointing out our human limitations when it comes to bringing about true spiritual transformation, we have now arrived at Romans chapter 8. And in Romans chapter 8, the entire focus is really on the one who brings about true spiritual change within our lives in the first place. Romans chapter 8 is all focused on the third person of the Godhead who is none other than God the Holy Spirit. And what Romans chapter 8 does is that it provides for us as believers, it provides us with assurance despite of our shortcomings, despite our failings. And we see this when we look at the beginning and the end, even, of Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 begins with the no condemnation, and then it caps it off at the end with no separation. And everything in between the no condemnation and no separation from from the love of God, everything in between those two points, it's all pointing and giving us assurance of spiritual victory. It's all telling us and explaining to us and reminding us that we have victory over the power of sin in the present, but that we will also one day have victory over the presence of sin in the future. In verses 1 to 4, we saw that there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus because the Holy Spirit has applied to us the benefits of Christ's work upon the cross He has freed us from the power of sin and death. Then last week in verses 5 to 8, we were given a contrast. And there was a contrast between the life of a believer compared to the life of an unbeliever. And really the main point that we were able to draw from that study is that the Holy Spirit fundamentally changes who we are. That when the Holy Spirit regenerates us from within, when He changes our hearts, It's impossible for us to remain the same. And really, that brings us right up to today's study of Romans chapter 8, verses 9 to 13. And in these verses, Paul not only wants to remind us of how the Holy Spirit has taken residence within us, but he also wants us to understand that the indwelling Holy Spirit brings to us certainty. Now, in case you're wondering, we are going to see three specific ways in today's study in terms of how the indwelling Holy Spirit brings certainty to us as believers. Three ways that we can have assurance because the Holy Spirit dwells within us. Firstly, in verse 9 and verse 10, we're going to see that the indwelling Holy Spirit brings us certainty of transformation. That's what we'll see, number one. Secondly, we're going to see that the indwelling Holy Spirit brings to us certainty of God's ownership. That's in verse 9 and verse 11. And thirdly, we're going to see the indwelling Holy Spirit brings certainty of spiritual victory, and that's in verses 12 and 13. Three areas of certainty that the Spirit gives. Transformation, God's ownership, and spiritual 
victory. Now, needless to say, a big part of today's study is really going to be focusing on the person and the work of the Holy Spirit, which in his involvement within our lives as believers. And so let us now give our attention to the first part of verse 9 and also verse 10. And this is where we see, first of all, that the indwelling Holy Spirit brings to us certainty of transformation. Notice in your Bibles there, look at how Paul puts it in verse 9. He says, But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. And then jumping down to verse 10. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. And so what are we seeing here? Well, what are we seeing here in these verses? What is Paul wanting us to understand from what it is that he's saying here in verse 9 and verse 10? What is the thought that Paul is wanting to get across in these verses? What is the thought that he's wanting to convey to us 2,000 years later from these verses that he has just written? Well, I think it's clear to see that Paul is wanting to, to bring certainty to us as believers. After all, leading up to verse 9, what have we seen? We've seen that Paul has been contrasting between the life of an unbeliever compared to the life of a believer. And what have we seen? Well, in verse 5, we saw that the unbeliever's life lives according to the flesh, and they have their mind continually fixed on the things of the flesh. We saw in verse 6 that the carnal, that is the fleshly mind, the fleshly carnal mindset of the unbeliever is death meaning that it demonstrates that that person is cut off from relationship with God. In verse 7, we saw Paul talks of the unbeliever's carnal, fleshly mind being at war against God. His mind is at war against God, and his mind refuses to be subject to the Word of God. And what's more, we saw in verse 7, that that deprived mind is incapable of thinking any differently about God. They're unable, they're incapable. Therefore, as we saw in verse 8 last week, Paul said that the unbeliever, the life who's characterized and patterned after the works of the flesh, they are incapable of pleasing God. But then we get to verse 9, and what does Paul do in verse 9? Well, he switches, doesn't he? He switches from talking about what characterizes the life of an unbeliever, and instead, what does he do? He wants to now bring certainty to us who are believers. Notice again what he says in verse 9. He says, but you, in other words, talking to believers, not talking about the unregenerate, not talking about those whose heart has not been changed, not talking about those whose lives are characterized and patterned after the works of the flesh, but you, born-again believers, regenerate believers, he says, you are not in the flesh but in the Spirit, if, a conditional clause here, indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, what is he saying? Well, he's telling us that we as believers are different. We are distinct compared to unbelievers. And did you notice what the fundamental difference is? Did you notice what condition which brings about this difference between the believer and the unbeliever in the first place? Well, it's really quite simple, isn't it? That difference is that the, the believer has the Holy Spirit dwelling within them, whereas the unbeliever does not. In other words, if a person has the Holy Spirit dwelling within them, this brings certainty that their lives will not be patterned after or lived char characteristically after the flesh, but instead it brings certainty that their lives will be patterned and characterized after the things of the Holy Spirit. And that's what Paul says exactly there in verse 9. You, believer, you are not of the flesh if the Holy Spirit dwells within you. And he goes to elaborate this a little bit more in verse 10. Notice in your Bibles in verse 10, he elaborates it. It says, if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. In other words, when a person is in union with Christ, the Holy Spirit brings about an undeniable transformation within their lives. 
Yes, as Paul puts it here in verse 10, our bodies are dead because of sin. Now, what is he talking about? Well, he's talking about what he means is our physical bodies, these ones that we are carrying us around right here today, they all bear and they still carry the effects of the fall and the effects of sin. So one day, these physical bodies will die. We will die a physical death. But while our outward, well, outward self is perishing, meaning our outward body here is perishing, Paul makes it very clear here in verse 10 that our inward self is very much spiritually alive and flourishing. Why? Because he says, the righteousness which is from God is now in us by means of the indwelling Holy Spirit of God. That's quite a change, isn't it? It's quite, it's quite, quite a, 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 a transformation. Again, Paul tells us that the indwelling of the Holy Spirit brings certainty of spiritual transformation. Now, I, I think it would be helpful for us at this point in time to just to spend a few moments now just to remind ourselves of the actual work of the Holy Spirit within our lives as believers. I think it would be beneficial for us just to refresh our memories of the intimate involvement of the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, how involved and exactly how involved he is on a not only historically but on a day-to-day -day basis in transforming us from within. Because I don't know about you, but sometimes I can become somewhat forgetful. I can become forgetful of just how actively involved the Holy Spirit is within my present life. And I don't think I'm the only one. You see, sometimes it can be very easy for us to understand the, the biblical theology of the Holy Spirit. We just have to grab our systematic theology textbook, don't we? And we read through that and you go, well, in an evening, I've sat down and I've now intellectually, academically understood what the Bible teaches concerning the Holy Spirit. So sometimes we can understand the biblical theology of the Holy Spirit, but what we can sometimes do as believers is we can sometimes unknowingly overlook the present reality of the Holy Spirit. You ever felt that before? You ever experienced that before? I know I have. You understand, and understand the, third, the third person of the Godhead theologically, academically, intellectually, but sometimes failing to recognize his work here in the pres as a present reality. So let's now just take a few short moments by way of reminder. And I know that for some of us, maybe I hear I'm just preaching to the choir. Maybe there's some of us that go, I know the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm not, I'm not asking today, do you know it intellectually or academically or even theologically? I want us to try to take a look at this with fresh eyes and go, this is the God himself that is in us right now, working actively, and I want us to try to see the present reality of the Holy Spirit more clearly within our lives as well. Let's let Scripture do this for us. For starters... Where does the Holy Spirit's work practically within our life actually start? Well, it began with regeneration. It began when God the Holy Spirit came in and he changed our hearts and he made us spiritually live from within. Titus chapter 3 verses 4 and 5 says, But when the kindness, of, kindness and love of God our Savior toward men appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. How so? Through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. That was the entry point. That is the time when, the, when God, the Holy Spirit, came into our lives. He regenerated us. He made us born again. And then having regenerated us, having enabled us to be born again, as we call it, the Holy Spirit continued His work. And that work looked like bringing conviction to our sinful state. Jesus speaks of the Holy Spirit's convicting work in John chapter 16, verses 7 and 8, and this is where he says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the Helper, as we'll see shortly is reference to the Holy Spirit, the Helper will not come to you. But if I depart, he says, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of Sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. And so the Holy Spirit regenerates us. He changes our hearts. He brings the conviction of our sinful state. 
And when we responded correctly to the Holy Spirit's conviction, trusting Christ through the gospel, what happened? Well, the Holy Spirit continued His work by baptizing us, immersing us, and uniting us together within the body of Christ. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. He says, For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, we have all been made to drink into one Spirit. And so having been united together, having been brought into the body of Christ, the Holy Spirit there has set up permanent residence within us, dwelling within our physical bodies. We're told this in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. It's where Paul says, Do you not know that you, that is your physical bodies, are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells within you? God not only changing our hearts, but now God, the Holy Spirit, indwelling us permanently within us. And as God the Holy Spirit now comes and He takes up residence within us, the Holy Spirit, He applied all that the Father had purposed and all that the Son had purchased upon the cross, and He applied that to us. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14, Paul says, But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, Beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth, to which He called you by our gospel for obtaining of glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the Spirit takes that which the Father has purposed, that which the Son has purchased, and He indwells and He applies that within our lives. Now, for us as Christians, those are things that have taken place in the past. Those are things that this is transforming work of the Spirit, changing our hearts, bringing conviction, giving us faith to believe in the gospel, having the benefits of the work of Christ applied to us. This has already taken place in the past for us as believers. However, the work of the Spirit continues to this present day. It continues each and every day in our lives in a variety of kind, a variety of different kinds of ways. And so let's just remind ourselves of how the Holy Spirit within us is actively at work within us, which by the way, He is actively at work within us right at this point. Do you know that? We are not just talking about theory right now. We are talking about God Himself in us, illuminating our mind, helping us to understand actively working in us right now. Let's be mindful of this. For instance, what does the Holy Spirit do in us? Well, for instance, the Holy Spirit right now, He teaches us and He reminds us of spiritual truth. Jesus said in John 14, verses 25 and 26, These things I have spoken to you while being present with you, but the Helper, and here it is, the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. And he'll bring to remembrance all things that I have said to you. But in addition to teaching us and reminding us of spiritual truth, the Holy Spirit also helps us and he continually points us to the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus says in John 14, 16 and 17, I will pray the Father, he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees Him nor knows Him, but you know Him, for He dwells with you, and He will be, where? In you. He says also about the help and the testimony of the Spirit pointing us to Christ in John 15, verse 26. And Jesus says, But when the Helper comes, whom I shall send from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father... He will testify of me. He points us to Christ. He illuminates our mind to Christ. But in addition to helping us spiritually, we also see from Scripture that the Holy Spirit illuminates, that is, makes alive, makes um, us aware of spiritual truth. He brightens 
He shines a torch on spiritual truth so that we can see it, that we can understand it, that we can comprehend it. We see this in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10, and Paul says, but God, talking about deeper spiritual truths, Paul says, but God has revealed them to us through His Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of man except the Spirit of man which is in him, even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. In other words, it is a prerequisite for someone to truly grasp spiritual truth. It is a prerequisite for them to first have the indwelling Spirit and the illumination of the Spirit within them. Now, he says in verse 12, Now we have not received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. And then he finishes in verse 13 by saying, These things we also speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. So, we begin to see this, aren't we? We're seeing the way that the work of the Holy Spirit is presently in, in, in taking part within our lives. But not only has the Holy Spirit illuminated, illuminated our thinking so that we can grasp and understand spiritual truth, the work of the Holy Spirit also involves empowering us to be effective witnesses for Christ. Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus says to his disciples, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. But in addition to empowering us to be able to be effective witnesses, the Holy Spirit just brings about a spiritual strength. We're talking about a strength, an inner strength. Oftentimes we know what it feels like to be weak, don't we? There are seasons in our life where we just can't put our finger on it, but we just, we just feel weak in and of ourselves. The Holy Spirit strengthens us in that. Because listen to what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 to 16. He says, For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and on earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man. We see what he's saying, don't we? When we need strength, when we need spiritual stamina for the things that are before us, the Holy Spirit comes and He gives that to us. But in addition to strengthening us, we see in Scripture that the Holy Spirit also actively is producing spiritual fruit within our lives. Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 to 23. But the fruit of the Spirit. In other words, what the Holy Spirit produces in our lives that will become more increasingly seen within our lives as Christians is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. The Holy Spirit produces fruit within our lives. But in addition to producing fruit, the Holy Spirit, His work also involves gifting us gifting us spiritually for service within the body of Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, the Apostle Paul says, But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. And then he goes and lists some types of spiritual giftings that God gives. And then he says in verse 11, But one and the same Spirit works all things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. Now, my friends, there are other ways in which the Holy Spirit works within our lives. He, he seals us. He guarantees us. He provides us certainty of glorification. He provides us certainty of a, a future, future resurrection of our bodies. And we're going to get to those very shortly. But for now, hopefully we can see that the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is not merely a passive bystander, when it comes to our lives as believers. Hopefully we can see here that the Holy Spirit is not uninvolved. He's not an uninvolved onlooker when it comes to his involvement within our lives in terms of bringing about transformation. But hopefully we can see here that the Holy Spirit is continually, 
And I would argue right at this very moment, for us as believers, he is continually at work within us and he is actively involved in bringing about spiritual transformation. I mean, think about it for a moment. The Holy Spirit regenerated us. He baptized us. He convicted us. He indwells us. He teaches us. He reminds us. He empowers us. He helps us. He illuminates spiritual truth for us. He produces spiritual, tr- spiritual fruit in us. He gifts us. And by the way, he goes and he applies all that the Father has purchased and all that the Son has accomplished to us. And so we can th- when we think about it, all that the work of the Holy Spirit is actually doing within us right now, we can understand what it is that Paul says in verse 9 here, right? Verse 9 of chapter 8, look at it again with that. Think of the doctrine of the Holy Spirit and how he works within us, transforming us, and look at verse 9 in your Bibles again. He says, but you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. And we can understand this, can't we? We can understand why Paul tells us that the indwelling Holy Spirit brings about a certainty of transformation. We can understand that if the Holy Spirit dwells within us, it is impossible for there to be no transformation in our lives given how actively involved Scripture tells us the Holy Spirit is actually involved within our lives. And so this is the first thing. This is the first thing that the indwelling of the Holy Spirit brings certainty of. The Holy Spirit brings certainty of transformation. That's number one. But in addition to transformation, we see also in verse 9 that the Holy Spirit also brings certainty of God's ownership. So that's number two. Notice how Paul puts it in the second part of verse 9. He says, Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ... He is not his. Now, what is Paul talking about here? What is he trying to get at? Well, if you could summarize it into one word, that one word would be ownership. We can put it this way. If a person does not have the Holy Spirit dwelling within them, then God does not consider that person to be his own. If a person is without the Spirit of God... They simply do not belong to God. And if a person doesn't belong to God, guess what? That person is not a true believer. They are not a true child of God. On the flip side, according to Scripture, the opposite is also true. Those who do have the Holy Spirit dwelling within them, they do belong to God. They are God's possession, and God is keeping them until the day of redemption. This brings us to another way the Holy Spirit works within our lives as believers. The Holy Spirit seals us. That is, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in the believer. And God, at that point, puts his mark of ownership on us as being truly his. Now, I want us to see this in the Scriptures ourselves. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. I want us to see what the Holy Spirit does putting his seal or God's mark of ownership upon our lives when he comes to indwell us. It says in Ephesians 1, verses 13 to 14, In him, Christ, you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the day of redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Paul summarizes it in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22. Similar kind of thing. He says, Now he who establishes us with you in Christ has anointed us as Christ. As God. Us as God. And also has, notice it there, sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Now, Two words in each of those passages I just want us to focus on for one moment here. The first word is the word sealed, and the second word is the word guarantee. And what is a seal? Well, a seal is an interesting one because it relates to the ancient practice of placing soft wax on one's correspondence, like on the back of a letter, and then 
you mark the back of that letter with that hot wax with a unique mark like a signet ring. It was a, the seal of a signet ring. This is what, what, the, what that would do. It, was, it would mark ownership and it would mark the originator of correspondence. And maybe we've seen this on old movies. Maybe we've seen, you know, a, a king, a governor, an official of some sort. They're writing a letter. They get that letter. They fold it up. They pop it inside an envelope. They flip the little cover over. And in order to seal that thing, what do they do? They, they pour a bit of hot wax on the back, which seals the cover and it seals to the letter itself, to the, to the envelope itself. A bit, of, a bit of wax goes on there. And then what happens after that bit of wax goes on there? Well, the wax then actually goes ahead and the wax actually um, provides the means in order for the, for the person to actually go and put their signet ring on there and be able to press it in, and then the wax dries, and then what you're left with is the mark of the official's ring. Now, what does this do? What does it do when someone actually goes ahead and, 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 and does this? Well, it marks ownership. It marks authenticity. What that seal did is that it provided security and protection that the letter hadn't been opened, the letter hadn't been tampered with. But you see, what that seal did that seal, it also symbolized authority. For instance, if you received correspondence, which included a seal from a king, you got a letter with the seal of a king on there, a governor, some other kind of official, well, you know that it carried weight. Whatever was in that letter, it carried weight of the authority of the official themselves. That is the word sealed that Paul uses in terms of the work of the Holy Spirit. But the other word is the guarantee. And what is a guarantee? A guarantee is just a down payment, a financial down payment, or a deposit that was given in good faith that the remaining payment would come at a future time to actually finish off the business transaction. You really, uh, what, what the guarantee was, it communicated the idea of a pledge, one that would provide certainty, one that would provide assurance that a buyer will continue and fulfill that transaction and continue and follow through with the purchase. And we understand this in everyday life, right? Anyone who's bought a house, what do they, how, how do they want, how, do, how, does the, how does the owner want you to mark that, to sort of say, hey, you know, I want to see your intention of, how, of what you're going to do with this property right now. They're going to ask for a deposit somewhat. They're going to say, we need a deposit, and what does that deposit do? As soon as the deposit has been made, well, then immediately that shows ownership is now yours, and it will come back at a future time where you have to pay for the whole thing but for the meantime, that guarantee, that deposit, that pledge is enough to say, I am going to follow through with the intention of which I began. That is the word guarantee. And so how do these words seal and guarantee, how do they relate to the work of the Holy Spirit within our lives? Because that's kind of where we're getting at now. How do they relate to our lives? Well, what is it that Paul, why is it Paul using these familiar ancient terms of being sealed and the guarantee? How does, why does he use these words to explain the work of the Holy Spirit within our lives? Well, I'm glad you asked. In the context of salvation, the seal, the seal points to God's ownership of the believer. It points to the fact that the believer has been bought with a price, and that price is the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. When the Holy Spirit comes to dwell a believer, it is an actual seal in the sense of authenticating that person as being a true child of God. Now, <clears throat> the immediate purpose of the seal is to identify those who are going to one day receive the full benefits of salvation at their future resurrection. Being sealed by the Holy Spirit gives us certainty that the, of the ultimate outcome of our salvation, it reminds us that our future is secure. But not only has the Holy Spirit sealed our lives as believers, we've seen in both of those passages, He also guarantees it. It is God's guarantee. The Spirit comes to dwell with us. When us. It is a guarantee that He is ultimately and will one day fulfill that promise of eternal life. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit is God's own pledge. It's God's own down payment. It's God's own deposit, which certifies, which provides assurance that what God has begun, He will see that through to completion. In other words, 
If God has sealed us with the Holy Spirit, it is the guarantee that he will see, see us through until salvation is complete with him one day in heaven. Now, if you look down to verse 11, Paul elaborates on this a little bit here. He explains that God's ownership over us by the Holy Spirit, it gives us certainty of future glorification. Because notice how he puts it there in verse 11. He says, but if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't know if Paul can put this any more clearly. I don't know if he can word it in any other way to try to get that intended meaning across to us. If we have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us, then the future resurrection of our glorified bodies is no less certain than the fact that Jesus rose again from the dead. Our future resurrection, if the, if the Spirit of God is in us, is, is that certain that we could liken it to Christ rising, the fact that Christ rose again from the dead. Now, that's a very bold thing to say, I know, but is this not exactly what Paul is communicating to us here in verse 11? The certainty of Christ rising from the dead gives us certainty that the same one who rose him from the dead now dwells in us and gives us certainty also of a future resurrection. Now, as we think about this tremendous truth for a little bit longer, listen to how Paul explains it in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 to 5. Tremendous truth of the Spirit of God in us, giving us assurance of a future resurrection. He speaks in 2 Corinthians 5 poetically about our spiritual bodies, which now carry in them the effects of the fall, the effects of sin, and therefore our physical bodies are perishing. But he also speaks about the hope of future glorification when we one day receive new glorified bodies with God in heaven. I want us to see how Paul talks about this, our future resurrected bodies, but I want us to also see the way that he makes the connection to that with the Holy Spirit within us. He says in 2 Corinthians 5, For we know that our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed. Talking about our human bodies. We have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed with our habitation which is from heaven. If indeed, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we are in this tent grown, for we who are in this tent grown, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up in life. Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, and then notice what he says there about this future resurrection, who also has given us the Spirit as, what? There it is, as a guarantee, as the deposit, as the down payment. Our future glorification is certain because of the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit within us. My friends, that is good news. That is tremendous news. What have we seen so far? Well, we've seen the indwelling Holy Spirit brings about certainty of transformation. That was number one. We've seen that the indwelling Holy Spirit brings about certainty of God's ownership, which, by the way, gives us assurance for the future. And this leads us to a third and final way in which the indwelling Holy Spirit brings certainty, and that is he brings certainty of spiritual victory. Because notice in verse 12 there, Paul begins with the word, therefore. Do you see it there in your Bibles? He says, therefore. In other words, in light of all the truths about the indwelling Holy Spirit that has just, that has just been communicated, in light of all that the Holy Spirit does within your lives, he goes on to say in verse 12, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die but if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Now, for the very first time in chapter 8, we see here that Paul issues a call to action. For the very first time in this chapter, we come to the realm of practical application. Up until this point, we have been given general description of the believer including the character of a believer, including the position of a believer. But here, Paul explicitly states 
the doctrine of sanctification, and he tells us exactly how we become sanctified, what our involvement is. In these verses, Paul urges us to wage the battle against the presence of indwelling sin with the new lives that God has granted to us, which have been enabled by the Holy Spirit. Notice in verses 12 to 13, Paul does not say, let go and let God. He doesn't say that, does he? As though our spiritual growth does not require any participation on our part. But instead, what does he say? Well, he exhorts us to put to death the deeds of the flesh. He tells us to mortify our sin through the strength of the new nature which God has brought about by the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. In fact, notice in verse 12 that Paul uses the word debtors. In other words, he's saying, we owe it to God. We owe it to God to live according to our new natures. We are obliged to yield to the Holy Spirit's influence and to crush the remaining sin which still, live, still works and is still present within our lives. We could put it this way. On the basis of the tremendous privilege that God has granted to us in Christ, on the basis of the indwelling spirit within us, which motivates us by this future hope of a future resurrection, guess what? We have a present responsibility. We have a present obligation to fulfill. We have a present responsibility and obligation. And by the way, we don't owe anything to our flesh, right? What does he say? We are debtors to God. Not, not according to the living to the flesh. My friends, we owe nothing to our sinful flesh. We owe our sinful flesh. We don't owe our, um, owe our sinful flesh anything. I mean, think about it. Why on earth would we give in to those fleshly des desires by the, the remaining indwelling presence of sin? Why would we give in to those desires? Why would we give in to our flesh, given that our flesh has done nothing for us apart from preparing an eternity of everlasting torment in hell if it wasn't for the grace of God? Why would we give the, the indwelling presence of sin any space within our lives? Why would we yield to it in any way, given all that this, all the flesh has done has just led us to a path of destruction? As believers, we are debtors to and we are obligated to live in a way that God has purposed us to live and enabled us to live by the indwelling presence of God. Now, my friends, <clears throat> we hear this strong call to action that we are to put to death the deeds of the flesh, that we're not to owe our flesh anything, but we're to owe, we're obliged, we're debtors to God and the new life that he's given to us. But I want to, something else I want, I want us to understand here, this is certainly not a cold impersonal, legalistic obligation. We don't like that sometimes, do we? We hear something that we have to do, something that we are to act upon as Christians. We go, oh, that sounds legalistic to me. It sounds like law to me. I'm not under the law. It means I do whatever I want. My friends, this, this exhortation to holiness, this is not some sort of cold, impersonal, legalistic obligation. But instead being motivated by the love of God and by the grace of God, this is an obligation which we should view as our reasonable service. Being motivated by the kindness of God and the mercy of God, how much kindness and mercy He has shown you and I, we are to then take that and walk worthy of the calling with which we have been called. My friends, there is nothing impersonal or cold or legalistic about that. You just have people who have, out of gratitude and thanksgiving for what God has done, respond in a reasonable way and live in a life that pleases him. Two very short passages just to point to, just to kind of help to bring application here because we are landing the plane. We're getting ready to land. We're ready to finish the study here today. And so what we're doing now is we're just trying to bring the study to a close. We're trying to apply the exhortation that Paul's given to us in verses 12 to 13. We've looked at the, the, the transformation of the Holy Spirit and, and God's ownership because of the Holy Spirit. Now we're talking about spiritual victory. We're talking about being debtors to God. And we want to really just really apply this now to our lives. And so let's think about this. 
Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30 is one of the two passages I just want to end on. Paul says here, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Do you see familiar wording when Paul talks about the Holy Spirit sealing us for the day of redemption? But notice the instruction that Paul actually gives here. He says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Now, what is he saying? Well, as the third person of the Trinity, he's telling us that God, the Holy Spirit, has the ability to feel emotion. And what's more, going by what Paul is saying in this verse, it is possible for us as believers to cause grief to the Holy Spirit. How? By failing to deal correctly with the sin in our lives. That's how. The word grieve, in case you're wondering, it means to cause sorrow, to cause pain, to cause unhappiness, to cause distress. My friends, here's the bottom line. The Holy Spirit within us is not unfeeling or untouched or unaffected when it comes to the sin within our lives. What this means is that if we are giving into the temptations of our sinful flesh, the question must be asked, well, I should say, the question is not only to be asked, what am I doing to myself? But if we're giving into those the temptations of our sinful flesh, the question must also be asked, what am I also doing to God? What am I doing to myself? What am I doing to my life by giving into that which owes has done nothing for me? What am I doing giving into that? What does that mean for me? But what am I also doing to God? Ephesians chapter 4, 30 is the first passage. A second, in light of Paul's instruction in Romans 12 and 13, second passage, I just want us to just finish on here, is 2 Corinthians 6, verses 19 to 20. A familiar passage to us. Paul says, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? You've been brought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. We're seeing ownership again, aren't we? And obligation as a result of ownership. Do we see how Paul exhorts us to live holy in these verses? He reminds us of the indwelling Holy Spirit within us. He reminds us the Holy Spirit has taken residence within us. He reminds us this is only made possible because of the immeasurable price that God himself has paid on our behalf to make us his own, bought with the blood of Christ. And it's in light of that truth, in light of the truth that we are now God's purchased possession, in light of the truth that God is now ours and he is now he is ours and we are his in light of that truth it is only right that we use the lives that god has given to us to glorify god the one who paid so dearly for our salvation now of course when paul calls us to action in verses 12 to 13 of romans 8 the only reason he's actually doing this the only reason he can call us to action to sanctification i guess you could call it the only reason he can do this is because he knows it is, a, it is possible for this to actually happen in the first place. The only reason that Paul exhorts us to not give in to the flesh, but to be a debtor to the Spirit, is because he knows that the indwelling Holy Spirit is within us, and with his help, there can be certainty of spiritual victory. That is the only reason why he exhorts us in the first place. My friends, as we bring this study now to a close let us think on the things that we have covered today. As we bring this study to a close, let us be reminded and meditate on the things that we have looked at from God's Word today. And as we think about these, of today's study and as we bring it to a close, may these truths be ever within our prayers. What have we seen? We have seen that the indwelling Holy Spirit brings to us certainty. He brings us certainty of transformation. We've looked at all the passages that talk about the works of the Holy, work of the Holy Spirit within our lives, not as an impersonal bystander, but someone who is presently active. We've seen, secondly, the, certain, the Holy Spirit brings about certainty of God's ownership, sealed, guaranteed 
giving us assurance both in the present and in the future. And we've also seen that the Holy Spirit brings about certainty of spiritual victory. We can look at verses 12 and 13 as we have this morning and we can see the exhortation of the Apostle Paul and we can say we know that this is possible. We know that this is possible because the Holy Spirit has enabled us to have victory over the the remaining presence of indwelling sin within our lives. It gives us certainty. And we remind ourselves of the truths. I'm not going to give into the flesh because I don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit within me. I'm not going to give into the flesh because I have been bought with a price. Therefore, I I am to glorify God in my body, which, by the way, belongs to Him. My friends, let us think on these things. Let us apply these truths, not just in a theological way, but let us apply these truths and think about how they apply to the sin that you're struggling with right now. Think about it for a moment. What is, what is the sin that you, are, what, that you are struggling with right now? What is the difficulty that you keep on coming up against? What is the thing that keeps on coming to mind every week when you're at commun- the time of communion and you're told to confess your sin? What is that recurring thing that you just see that seems to be with, within your life? My friends, apply the truths that we've seen here today to that. Be assured of spiritual victory over that. God has given you every single resource that he needs, and we don't need to give in to that. God working in us, us yielding to him, us utilizing the means of his sanctification, being in the word, being in prayer, being here at church like we are today. God has given us everything that we need. My friends, remember, you owe your sinful flesh nothing. Because all your sinful flesh has made you head for hell. But by God's kindness, his grace, his love, his mercy, he has made you his own. And so let us take heed of the instruction that we see here today. Let us live lives that are pleasing, that are glorifying to God. And my friends, we can only do this with the help of God himself. So let's pray and ask him for that. Father, thank you for your word today. We ask for your help. We ask for the things specifically in our lives that are that are difficult for us to, to overcome. We realize that the presence of sin can, can feel as though it has power, and Satan often tempts us to think that we are powerless against the, that presence of indwelling sin. But we pray that we would override that fear with faith this morning, that we would trust what your word says is true concerning the third person of the Godhead who now dwells within us. We ask for that transformation. We ask for the assurance of your ownership. And we ask for the present reality of that spiritual transformation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.